Okay, so the first topic we will cover is uh, general equilibrium and welfare. And the material for this chapter is to be found in chapter 13 in Nicholson and Snyder. It's a fairly long chapter and we will not be covering all the material in the chapter. So let's start. And in our studies of microeconomics up to this point, we mainly encountered partial equilibrium models. So in Eco 101, you will remember that we did models of supply and demand, and those were partial equilibrium models. Uh, we assumed uh, everything else remained the same, the Cetris Paribus assumption. When we assume that things are held constant and only one variable is allowed to change, then we have a partial equilibrium. So in demand and supply diagrams, on the demand curve or the supply curve, if we allow the price only to change, then the quantity demanded and supplied would also change. If anything else changed, a violation of the Cetris Paribas assumption, then the entire demand curve or supply curve would shift to the left or to the right. But you know these things already. So in partial equilibrium models, we look at markets separately. So for example, we might look at the market for rice. There's a supply curve of rice, a demand curve for rice, the two intersect to generate a market equilibrium. There's an equilibrium market price, an equilibrium market quantity demanded, and no excess supply or demand. And this is again, once again, this is material we covered in equal one and one. Let's move on. And in partial equilibrium analysis, we do not consider the impact on one market of other markets. Right? When we look at a market, it is the market for a single good or service only. So for instance, if we are looking at the rice market, we do not consider the effects on it of, for example, the bread market, right? So the, we look at the rice market in isolation. But of course, what goes on in the bread market is likely to have an impact on the rice market and vice versa, right? So if you think about it more deeply, if something happens in the bread market, for example, the price of bread goes up, that is obviously going to have an impact on the rice market and vice versa. So think about these issues, right? So think about what would be the impact on the rice market of say a decrease in the equilibrium price of bread. Economies consist of many often interrelated markets. Partial equilibrium is inadequate to describe the effects which occur when changes in one market have impacts on other markets. So as we just mentioned, if there's a change in the bread market, a partial equilibrium model of the rice market will not be able to capture that change in the bread market, the effects of the change in the bread market, right? So we need something stronger. We need a model that would able to handle, that would be able to handle multiple markets simultaneously as it were. So we need a model that permits us to view several markets simultaneously. A general equilibrium or GE model allows us to do so. A GE model also allows us to analyze the overall welfare impact of markets. Now recall that in Eco 101, we learn to measure welfare to consume a surplus, produce a surplus, and get weight loss. However, those welfare measures were restricted to single markets. In a GE model, we can extend welfare analysis to several markets all at once. So the starting point of our analysis is the perfectly competitive price system. We studied perfect competition in both Eco 101 and Eco 206, so we call the characteristics of a perfectly competitive market. It is described by a supply demand mechanism. There are a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers. There is a homogeneous good, 
right? So all goods are the same. And that includes factors of production like labor or capital and land, right? And each of these homogeneous goods has an equilibrium price established by the intersection of the supply curve and the demand curve. All markets clear, so there is no excess supply or excess demand. There is an equilibrium market price at which there is an equilibrium quantity demanded, which is equal to the quantity supplied. There are no transaction or transport charges. We assume that uh, transactions can be made costlessly. And then there is perfect knowledge. So buyers are completely informed and sellers are completely informed. As a result of these assumptions, we say that the law of one price prevails. The law of one price just means that there will not be different prices for the same good in the economy. The buyers are each individuals who maximize utility given prices and their budget constraints. So in Eco 206, you learned utility maximization. So a consumer maximizes his or her utility subject to a budget constraint. The sellers or the firms or producers are each profit maximizers for a given set of prices. Each firm has a small share of total output. And throughout our discussion, we assume that there are two goods being produced and consumed, namely X and Y. There are two factors of production, labor and capital. And at this point, it is also useful to mention that general equi equilibrium in demand can be represented by indifference curve diagrams. You studied indifference curve, di curve diagrams in equal to six. And remember what indifference curves represent, they, they represent consumer preferences. General equilibrium in supply can be represented by a production possibilities frontier, the PPF. The PPF is one of the first things that you studied in Co 101. We will now discuss an analytical tool used in GE analysis called an Edgeworth box. So this is important and pay careful attention. We will see how an Edgeworth box is constructed. Now suppose we have a pair of axes with some amount of good W measured on the vertical axis and some amount of good Z measured on the horizontal axis. And you know, W and Z could represent goods or they might represent factors of production. Let's keep things simple and just assume that they are two different groups. W and Z belong to two different entities or consumers. Let's keep things simple. Let's suppose there are two consumers who each consume goods W and Z and we call the consumers A and B. So here we see two pairs of axes, two pairs, a pair of axes, I beg your pardon. Uh, we measure W on the vertical axis and Z on the horizontal axis belonging to A. So if you look at the origin, OA, this represents the, cons the amount of W and Z available to individual A. We can rotate the axes upside down. And instead of A, we now have individual B or consumer B, who also has available some amount of W and Z. So we are still measuring W on the upside down vertical axis and Z on the horizontal but right to left axis. So the, the uh, axes for individual B are just upside down, okay? Now we put the two axes together. And we get the following diagram. Notice that the origins OA and OB are diagonally opposite. So consider a point like E inside the Edgeworth box. E, rep 